Ahoy there, mateys. Gather round for a tale of salty dogs and daring deeds of a man who danced around the globe like a jig on a buttered deck. I speak of Sir Francis Drake the swashbuckler supreme and his voyage that shook the very timbers of the world. In 1577, with Queen Elizabeth's sly grin and whispered hopes for plunder, Drake set sail with five ships, ready to circumnavigate the whole damn globe, a feat only Magellan had attempted before, and not without leaving half his crew as fish food. Drake's fleet was a motley crew, but the Pelican, soon rechristened the Golden Hind, was a sturdy galleon fit for a queen along with smaller, nimbler ships to dart, with na to dart through narrow seas like a fox through a hen house, they were ready. So why circumnavigate at all? England craved spices like a courtier craved gossip. Those precious powders, cinnamon, nutmeg and cloves were gold dust sprinkled on Tudor tongs, and the trade routes to them were tightly clutched by the Spanish, those greasy galleon hoarders. Drake, he had other plans. He aimed to carve out a new path, a secret passage around the bottom of South America and pinch a few Spanish galleons along the way just for good measure. The journey was a perilous jig. The Straits of Magellan, a watery dragon guard in the Pacific, roared with storms and spat out two of Drake's ships. But Drake, stubborn as a mule with a compass, pressed on. He even learned to speak the language of the stars with his astrolabe, that silver eye that navigated by celestial whispers. Then came a stroke of luck. He found a hidden passage, a watery back door he named the Drake Passage, a secret kept tighter than the courtier's love letters. Though he sailed, through he sailed, into the vast Pacific, where he traded with natives, danced with exotic birds, and even claimed a bit of California for England, calling it Nova Albion, because perhaps the Queen herself loved a bit of silver, and Albion means white in some language. But his pockets weren't just filled with seashells and feathers, he plundered a Spanish treasure ship so laden with gold it could pave a highway to El Dorado, proving England could pay, play the pirate game and win. He rounded Africa, battered but triumphant, returning home in 1580, a sun-kissed hero with a ship reeking of clothes and a legend taller than St. Paul's steeple. And what of the impact? It was like dropping a cannonball into the pond of European politics, Drake's voyage pro proved England was a maritime force to be reckoned with, challenging Spain's monopoly of the New World and boosting national pride like a flag unfurled in a gale. Queen Elizabeth used it as propaganda, a feather in her cap and a middle finger to England. So what does Drake's circumnavigation tell us about Elizabethan England? It was a time of ambition, a nation hungry, hungry for exploration, riches and a place of its own on the world stage. It was a time of innovation, with shipbuilders crafting vessels like the Golden Hind and a taut sails with the wind of change. It was a time of audacity, a time when men like Drake, armed with astrolabes and loaded with ballasts of courage, dared to dance around the globe and rewrite the map of the world. So raise a tank of your landlubbards and history buffs to Sir Francis Drake, the man who waltz around the world and proved that England, a kingdom where the sun never set, could outwit the Spanish Armada and dance its way into the pantheon of maritime powers. Now, if you excuse me, I have a date with a treasure map and a very persuasive cutlass.